Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's Update on Lymphoma from the 2020 American Society of Hematology Meeting Webinar. I'm Donna, and I'll be the moderator for today's call. During today's call, you will hear from an expert speaker, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during today's presentation, you can ask them at any time in the Q&A box in the webinar. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow this link to complete an evaluation of this program and gain certification of attendance. If you are listening by phone, this link will be sent to your email at the end of the webinar. And now I'm pleased to introduce Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown is the Associate Director of Patient Education at the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Welcome, Jesse. You can begin. Thanks, Donna. And thank you to each of you for taking the time to join us on today's update on lymphoma from 2020 American Society of Hematology webinar. We'd like to thank our sponsors of this webinar, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, Kite Agilead Company, and Regeneron. Before I turn the program over to our speakers, I want to share information with you on LRF. Access to expert disease information is so important, and we're thrilled to be able to bring you this educational program. LRF is the nation's largest nonprofit dedicated exclusively to lymphoma. Our mission is to eradicate this disease through investment in the most promising lymphoma research and to serve those impacted by lymphoma through quality education and support opportunities. As we continue to make progress in advancing lymphoma research, we also want to ensure that you have access to the latest information about your disease. The foundation provides comprehensive disease and treatment specific resources, programs, and services, all of which are offered free of charge and have been reviewed by lymphoma experts. Most relevant to today's call, LRF offers a variety of lymphoma-specific resources, many of which you can access at the bottom of your screen if you're utilizing the web link, or via LRF's website at lymphoma.org if you're on your phone. The LRF helpline can answer your specific questions about lymphoma, as well as discuss relevant treatment options and clinical trials. We also offer the Lymphoma Support Network, which is a one-to-one -one peer support program for people with lymphoma and their caregivers. The LSN connects patients and caregivers with volunteers who have similar experiences to help give others strength to meet the challenges they may have to face. We also offer a variety of publications that have been reviewed by lymphoma experts to ensure you have access to the latest lymphoma information. Our mobile app, Focus on Lymphoma, is an award-winning app that provides patients and caregivers access to comprehensive content as well as unique tools to help manage your disease. Finally, we have launched our COVID-19 Learning Center to support lymphoma patients and caregivers through this challenging time. Please visit our Learning Center for access to webinars, articles, and other resources specific to COVID-19. We'll also have a webinar on updates on COVID-19 from the 2020 American Society of Hematology later this month. Please visit our website or call our helpline to register. I really hope you'll take advantage of some of the great resources and services that LRF provides. If you have questions regarding what you've heard today, or if you need information about relevant treatment options and supportive care resources, you can reach out to LRF through our website at lymphoma.org or by calling our helpline at 1-800-500-9976. We have a wonderful program planned for you today with two expert speakers, and I'm honored to first introduce you to Dr. Sonali Smith. Dr. Smith is the Chief of the Section of Hematology and Oncology and Co-Director of the Lymphoma Program at the University of Chicago. She also is the co-leader of the Cancer Service Line and is an Elwood V. Jensen Professor of Medicine. Dr. Smith is the chair-elect of the Lymphoma Research Foundation Scientific Advisory Board, in addition to having served as an expert speaker on numerous patient and professional programs with LRS. Thank you so much for speaking on B-cell updates at our program today. I'll now turn the talk over to you. Thank you so much, Jesse. I really appreciate it. And also just want to say thank you to everybody who has taken time to join us today. Um, I've been a part of LRF for uh, almost 20 years, and it's really an outstanding organization, and I feel honored to be a part of it. So the topic today is to go over some updates uh, that were presented at the American Society of Hematology meeting conducted in uh, December of 2020. My focus will be on B-cell lymphomas, and then I'll pass it on to my colleague, who will talk about T-cell diseases. So just to set the stage, I think this uh, group knows quite well that when we talk about lymphoma, we're really talking about a family of diseases. And there are now uh, several dozen categories and maybe even 100 subtypes of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It's important to remember that the goal of treatment depends on exactly what we are treating. 
So histology means the type of lymphoma, and then clinical behavior falls into one of several groups. For some patients, such as diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, the goal of treatment is to cure, whereas for other uh, people where the, uh, the lymphoma may be more slow-growing or indolent, the goal of treatment is control. So depending on what we're treating, we have to look at the data, particularly response rates, uh, and how long these responses last with a slightly different lens. At the meetings uh, this past December, there were a number of really exciting abstracts that were presented. And to be honest, I think there were, you know, uh, almost 200 abstracts that I thought could be potentially interesting. In terms of distilling them for this group, uh, I put them into one of three categories. So I'll talk in somewhat general terms about some of the targeted treatments shown in red for slow-growing lymphomas. This includes lenalidomide, tazemetostat, and a class of drugs called PI3 kinase inhibitors. Then I'll uh, shift to cellular therapy advances and explain what cellular therapy means and talk about the data leading to FDA approval for mantle cell lymphoma, and then some questions as to where cellular therapy should be for diffuse large B cell lymphoma and also slow-growing lymphoma, such as follicular lymphoma and marginal zone lymphoma. And then finally, I have a few slides talking about a new generation of antibodies um, uh, that is really exciting, and I do think will get FDA approved at some point in the very near future. So let's start first by uh, just a brief uh, summary of targeted treatments for slow-growing lymphoma. And these agents fall into um, a group of drugs called uh, signaling inhibitors. So Again, maybe some people on this call already know what a signaling pathway is and how an inhibitor works, but I did want to just explain that signaling pathways are essentially a series of proteins. So if you look at the blue box, cells, uh, cancer cells rely on proteins that talk to one another and eventually tell the cell to grow, divide, invade, or spread. Signaling inhibitors, such as targeted drugs, will block proteins at some point in this pathway, leading to an inability of that cell to continue to grow, divide, invade, or spread. And some examples in lymphoma are listed in the top right-hand corner and include things like PI3 kinase inhibitors, and I've listed uh, three of the FDA-approved ones, idelalisib, copanlisib, and duvalisib, as well as some that are uh, very close to uh, being available, such as umbralisib. There's also another drug called an EZH2 inhibitor, which is tazemetostat. And again, these are targeted drugs that block a variety of different signaling pathways. There's also uh, information on immunomodulatory drugs. And here I like to think about it as the cancer cell or the lymphoma cell uh, being the seed that requires the right type of soil to grow. And the soil can be blocked by drugs such as lenalidomide, and this gets rid of all of the background supporting cells and eventually the cancer cell cannot survive. With those two pathways or mechanisms in mind, some of the uh, data that was presented this year at ASH uh, focus on exactly those three groups of drugs. So tazemetostat is a new drug. This is an oral agent that was FDA approved in 2020. It blocks a, a protein called EZH2, and the gene for this protein can be mutated in patients with follicular lymphomas, as well as some marginal zone lymphoma. The data is strongest for follicular lymphoma, where having an EZH2 mutation makes that particular lymphoma more likely to respond to a treatment such as tazemetostat. What was presented at ASH this year was an update of the tazemetostat data, but also showing it in uh, combination with lenalidomide and rituximab and this is a clinical trial that is ongoing and available to people um, with follicular lymphoma. There were also updates on lenalidomide, which is the second bullet point listed here. So again, this is a pill, and it seems to work better when it's combined with rituximab. And what was shown at ASH is an analysis of a trial called the AUGMENT trial, specifically focusing on people over the age of 65. And what they showed is that lenalidomide and rituximab works uh, very well in patients who are over the age of 65, with the vast majority of patients going into a complete remission and having this complete remission last for several years. This is very exciting for a disease like follicular lymphoma, 
where for a long time we have used rituximab alone. And this particular study combined lenalidomide rituximab against uh, lenalidomide, I'm sorry, against rituximab alone and shows that the two together are better than, than rituximab. There's also um, some data, uh, this, uh, sort of the third uh, dash within the second bullet, showing that lenalidomide and rituximab can also be used in people who have not been uh, previously treated. This is also um, listed at least in NCCN as an option, uh, but what they really showed is that not only can we get people to go into a complete remission by CT scans or PET scans, but even by very sophisticated tests such as molecular tests. And then finally, the third bullet here is on PA3 kinase inhibitors. And at ASH this year, we specifically heard uh, some information about copanlisib, which is a PI3 kinase inhibitor, added to rituximab in patients with follicular lymphoma who had not previously been treated, and uh, showed, again, some very promising activity, as well as duration of response. And then finally, umbralisib and ublituximab are two drugs, a PI3 kinase inhibitor and an antibody, that are also being tested. When it comes to cellular therapy, um, I'll cover just a few uh, pieces of information about mantle cell lymphoma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and indolent lymphoma. So what is cellular therapy? Typically, when we think about cellular therapy, we're talking about chimeric antigen receptor T-cells. So this is a technology where if you look at the T-cell at the top right of the picture, uh, these T-cells are essentially transduced with something called a lentiviral vector that allows the cell to now make a protein that has two sides to it. And this is shown in the box to the left. The outside binds to whatever target you want it to be. And in lymphoma's case, it's CD19, which is a protein on your lymphoma cells. The inside part of the receptor activates the T cell once it finds its target. So once the, um, the uh, CAR T cells are given, if they find their target, they end up killing that particular cell and activating the immune system. This process and this technology is FDA approved for people with diffuse large B cell lymphoma that has come back after two prior lines of therapy. And the question at ASH this year was, what are some other places we can use this? So um, there are three uh, CAR-T products that are furthest along. So if you see this in the literature, they can be nicknamed AxiCell, Tysacell, and Lysacell. And all three products are slightly different in terms of how, um, what their side effects are and when uh, the side effects occur. But largely speaking, I think it's very difficult to compare the three at this time. So what was new at ASH was uh, there was an update of cellular therapy, or CAR-T, in people with mantle cell lymphoma that has come back after prior treatment. Um, so this was FDA approved in July of 2020, and the update looked at 68 patients that had up to five prior treatments, and they found that the majority of patients responded and that the, uh, that the response lasted for uh, at least for as long as the trial was the follow-up, which is almost two years. In terms of side effects, there was nothing new that was identified uh, compared to other cellular therapy trials. Uh, it's important to know that 37% of patients did have serious side effects but in the vast majority of patients, these resolved uh, with, with following treatment. So looking at the actual uh, results, 92% of patients with mantle cell lymphoma that had been so heavily pretreated responded with 67% of patients going into a complete response. And with 18 months of follow-up, about half of the patients remain in response. And if patients had a complete response, they're uh, doing even better uh, with, with about 70% of people staying in, in remission. So this was FDA approved in 2000 and a step four for mantle cell lymphoma. Now what about diffuse large B cell lymphoma? Um, we know that when people are first diagnosed, the standard of care is to give a combination of drugs called RCHOP. But what we know is that although RCHOP can cure a good portion of people, it does not cure everybody. And if you look at the bottom uh, part of the slide on the right, there are a number of uh, predictors for who may or may not be cured with RCHOP. And so the key challenges for research in this area is to increase the number of patients cured with frontline treatment, and then also find better options for people if the disease comes back or does not respond at all. So with this in mind, there was a very interesting trial, um, if you start up at the top left corner, that looked at patients uh, who were considered to have high-risk diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. 
and they defined high risk in this study as people who had double hit lymphoma. This is something where there's two uh, genomic rearrangements are of MYC and BCL2 uh, that makes it more resistant to chemotherapy, or if they had a high prognostic index, something called a high IPI. In these patients, um, they all started with standard chemotherapy, either RCHOP or EPOC-R, and then a PET scan was done after two rounds of therapy. If the PET scan showed that there was still disease or, or if there was new disease, then those patients were taken off of their RCHOP or EPOC-R and went straight to cellular therapy, this time with the product called AxiCell. This is a small study, so if you look at the results at the bottom, there were 23 patients who were included, and the follow-up has been about uh, one year, which is a little bit on the shorter side. There were some typical side effects seen that we expect with cellular therapy, but what's really exciting is that 74% of patients had a complete response to the AXI cell therapy, and that the T cells, when they tested them in the lab, seemed to be very effective. They were more fit uh, than, for example, T cells in patients who have had lots of prior therapy. So the question really is, you know, should CAR T be moved up in the treatment of patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, or should it stay in some of the areas where it's already FDA approved? And I think we need to see what this trial shows with longer follow-up and with more patients who are included. Now, what about slow-growing tumors um, or slow-growing lymphomas? You know, these are lymphomas such as follicular lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, and, uh, and, you know, these are lymphomas that we know we can control for a long period of time, but we cannot technically cure them. And there may be some patients where the disease has come back multiple times and standard treatments may not be working. So in this setting, cellular therapy, or CAR-T, was tested in a trial called the Zuma-5. So this included uh, 84 patients who had follicular lymphoma and 20 patients with marginal zone lymphoma. The uh, median age was 61 years old. There were some patients who were in their 70s, but most people were in their 60s. Um, these were patients with follicular lymphoma or marginal zone lymphoma that had a lot of prior treatment. Um, two-thirds of the patients had at least three prior types of therapy, and two-thirds of patients had disease that was no longer responding to any of the standard approaches. Um, the results for this trial um, are that almost everybody responded to the cellular therapy. 94% of patients responded, and in follicular lymphoma, 80% had a complete response, meaning that, it dis that the disease disappeared with a PET scan. In marginal zone lymphoma, which was a smaller group of patients, the, the response rate was 85% and 60% had a complete response. Um, there were the expected side effects from cellular therapy, which includes some low blood counts, infection, cytokine release syndrome, um, and some toxicity to the, to the neurologic system. Um, and very few people actually died during this study, but there was at least one uh, death that may have been related to therapy. But I think what's exciting here um, is that there is activity. The big question is, uh, is this a cure? Is this meant for everybody? And has the follow-up been long enough to know what these early response rates mean? And the answer really is that we have to wait. This was an initial investigation, and I think there are many people who are very excited about this, but it's certainly not at a point where we can uh, really understand how to uh, put this into practice, and it's certainly not yet FDA approved. So the take-home messages for the cellular therapy part of this talk is that CAR-T is a type of cellular therapy that engineers a patient's own T cells to better attack lymphoma cells. Uh, it's currently FDA approved for people who have diffuse large B cell lymphoma that has come back after two lines of prior therapy. It is also newly FDA approved for patients with mantle cell lymphoma that has returned after prior treatment. And there are some investigational uses that I just shared with you. So the last part of what I will cover is enhanced and bispecific antibodies. And again, by way of background, an antibody is a protein that the body naturally makes and can also be engineered in a lab. And the protein has different pieces to it including the top part, if you look, it's a Y-shaped protein that has a lot of different components, but if you look at the top part of the Y, this is what binds to the target. So if that target is CD20, that's what, how rituximab works. If it's CD19, that's how a number of other antibodies work. Um, so there is now a new antibody called tofacitimab that was FDA approved last year, 
Um, and this is an, an antibody, a monoclonal antibody that attacks a protein called CD19 that lives on lymphoma cells. Um, in a very, uh, you know, exciting study, this was combined with lenalidomide and found to have uh, activity in people who have diffuse large B cell lymphoma that has come back after multiple lines of prior therapy. So now it's important to know that this uh, antibody attacks the same protein that CAR T does. And there have been a lot of questions as to what do we, you know, what can we do for patients who um, uh, have relapsed or refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma but cannot get to CAR T. And I think in that particular setting, tafacitumab now is added to the list of options for people in this situation uh, and has a response rate of about two thirds percent. I'm sorry, two thirds. And uh, the vast majority of responders have remained in remission now nearing two years. So uh, to list some of the options for people with diffuse large B cell lymphoma where CAR T or transplant is not an option, I think clinical trials is still very important. But the three items listed in green are newly FDA approved within the last year or two uh, and updated based on uh, data that was presented at ASH. So what, are, uh, what about other ways to make antibodies work better? There is a new and very exciting area called bispecific antibodies. So this takes that same Y-shaped antibody that, we, that I presented a few slides ago and takes pieces of it and combines it so that instead of binding to just one target, these antibodies bind to more than one target. And there's different ways that you can combine them. Um, bispecific means that you're uh, targeting two different proteins. So instead of just being against CD19 or just being against CD20, these are uh, drugs, antibodies, that bind to more than one target, and in particular what they do is they'll bind to a B cell, which is the cancer cell in this case, and also bind to a T cell. And this brings the patient's own uh, immune system right where the lymphoma is with the hope that it will get rid of the lymphoma right, right where the, the lymph nodes are enlarged. So there's different types of engineering that can be given uh, or designed uh, for these bispecific antibodies, and I've just listed a few of them. The reason they're important is that depending on what the structure is, these antibodies can live for a very short period of time, which means that you might have to have a continuous infusion in order for the antibody to be around enough, hang around enough, or if you can engineer them where they last a little longer, they can be given maybe once a week uh, or even less often. And so here's just a cartoon showing if you have a bispecific antibody that it can bind to your tumor cell and the T cell and bring everything together so that you can get the most amount of killing within a local area for the lymphoma. So at ASH this year, uh, there were multiple new bispecific antibodies that were presented. Um, and what was exciting is that uh, not only are these a special type of immunotherapy, but they can be combined safely with chemotherapy or other agents, at least in some of these early clinical trials. Um, some of the side effects is that you can activate these T cells a little too much and get the cytokine release syndrome, but that overall these were very safe. They could be given as an outpatient, and some patients had very long uh, duration of response um, that was really exciting to see. So um, I listed here just five of the clinical trials that were presented and the two, uh, anti two uh, targets that they attack. So for example, the bispecifics in this top red one are against CD20 as well as CD3, so they bring a B cell and a T cell together, and then the bottom one is against CD19 and CD3. So very exciting new class of agents that I think we're gonna hear a lot more about in the coming year, um, and hopefully will lead to an FDA approval at some point in the next couple of years. Uh, when I think about where these bispecific antibodies might go, again, I think for uh, people with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, uh, there's some potential that patients who can't get to CAR-T or transplant might really benefit from these less uh, toxic and less intensive uh, approaches. So the take-home messages on antibody treatments is that targeted treatment with antibodies has been very effective for lymphomas, remembering that rituximab is actually the first antibody to be FDA approved for use in human cancer, and that there are new approaches to improve antibody treatment, including um, uh, attaching a payload. I didn't talk about this, but that's how brentuximab vidotin and poltuzumab vidotin work. Uh, engine the antibody to work better, such as acitimab or obinutuzumab, or combine targets to make specific antibodies. So 
just to summarize before I turn it over to Dr. Harikos, um, ASH 2020 was very exciting. We have a number of new approvals that are listed here, and we have some new treatments that are on the horizon, including bispecific antibodies and expanding the role for CAR-T. Um, and then I'll just share um, a painting uh, that Amy Lanfear, one of our LRF uh, members, uh, in terms of patient advocacy, uh, drew and painted uh, in honor of her son, Michael Lanfear, who had lymphoma. With that, I will stop and turn it over to Dr. Havico. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, we'll take all questions at the end, as I'm now honored to introduce Dr. Brad Havercus. Dr. Havercus is a hematologist and assistant professor at the University of Colorado Medical Campus, where he also serves as the Mature T-Cell Lymphoma Leukemia Program Lead. Dr. Haverkus has also served as expert speaker at numerous patient programs for LRS. Thank you so much for speaking today. I'll now turn the talk over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you all for, for joining and uh, letting me be your T-cell lymphoma doctor representative. It's an honor to uh, present to you all today. <clears throat> so at ASH, like Dr. Smith was saying, there was uh, a really a lot of exciting presentations, including some really nice work in T-cell lymphomas, and um, I want happy to present all these to you. So just by way of uh, some introduction, uh, T-cell lymphomas and, and what we're discussing today are really mature T-cell lymphomas. Uh, just uh, briefly, uh, T-cell lymphomas, uh, T-cells begin their sort of development in the bone marrow, and they get matured in the thymus and get educated, and then they traffic and go to all sites of the body. And they, um, one of the uh, T-cells can go to either blood, lymph nodes, splint, spleen, or the skin. And, and we, they, they get this name, sometimes peripheral T-cell lymphomas, uh, because these T-cells are trafficking to all these sites uh, in the body peripherally. And so we're discussing today, we'll discuss um, the updates on mature T-cell lymphomas. So <clears throat> lymphoma um, can be broken down, like Dr. Smith was, was uh, shared there, uh, into Hodgkin lymphoma or non-Hodgkin lymphomas. And based on the type of immune cell that's affected, uh, we have uh, break things down by whether they're T cells, NK cells, or B cells. And uh, within T cell lymphomas, we think about them, uh, or they can be divided based on whether they are primary cutaneous diseases or a systemic or nodal problem. Um, and then similarly, we can describe them as or characterize them as either an indolent disease or an aggressive disease. Uh, where you see most of these, uh, the primary cutaneous T-cell lymphomas really live uh, in the indolent t uh, world, where these are the slow-growing lymphomas that, that often we don't cure. Um, but that we do have a number of treatment options for them, uh, whereas these peripheral or nodal um, T-cell lymphomas, there's only a small portion of them that we would consider really slow-moving diseases, whereas the opposite is true um, in the aggressive uh, categorization of T-cell lymphomas. We see that the vast majority of those are peripheral uh, T-cell lymphomas or nodal T-cell lymphomas, and only a but a small portion of, of primary cutaneous T-cell lymphomas can be aggressive. So I just wanted to provide that as some uh, context, and I'll break really the rest of my talk up uh, based on whether things are cutaneous T-cell lymphoma or a peripheral uh, aggressive T-cell lymphoma. So first, <clears throat> discuss some of the updates in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Uh, first, we know that cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is an indolent disease, it is, uh, again, one of the slower-moving lymphomas, slower-moving indolent lymphomas. We treat cutaneous T-cell lymphomas uh, based on their stage, where early-stage disease is often treated with just skin-directed uh, therapies, and the more advanced-stage diseases get treated with other uh, systemic diseases. Um, rarely do we need to use things like chemotherapy, uh, with the exception of very advanced stage diseases. Uh, more often, uh, early stage disease is treated with skin directed, or maybe some of the more targeted therapies that we have are kind of uh, moving a little bit earlier into, or moving into earlier lines of therapy now. 
And I'm not going to go into all the all the therapies that exist for cutaneous T cell lymphoma, just to sort of keep in mind that that early stage disease is is really treated with skin directed therapies for the most part, um, with uh, the exception of now some of these better therapies that we have and more targeted therapies are getting used a little bit more in early stage disease, um, but but we tend to wait until people have progressed after skin directed therapy before they would need some of these systemic options. And before discussing a lot of the a lot of the clinical trials and, and sort of a lot of um, uh, you know what probably many of you are interested in, I just wanted to highlight um, that that without sort of the really preclinical uh, hard work in the laboratory, that we don't really have these later stage clinical trials. And so I just wanted to first start with uh, some really interesting work in the cutaneous T cell lymphoma space um, and highlighting. Uh, two uh, researchers who have really done some work uh, in the first bullet there to try to h help us understand how we can maybe use immunotherapy f for cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. Um, certainly not a trivial uh, issue, and so I just wanted to highlight that first, and then we can jump right into some of the new drugs and, and novel therapies that are uh, out there. <clears throat> this first uh, first paper, first uh, research, uh, first study here, was a drug uh, called BNZ1, um, where it, in this next slide, really uh, targets or blocks certain pathways that are relevant in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Um, so it blocks these, these different what called cytokines here, which are um, play different roles in the development of, of cancers and of, of T-cell lymphomas. Uh, we see that uh, this this molecule or this compound BNZ1 can block this certain pathway, the IL-15 pathway, which may contribute a lot to the pruritus and itching that, that people deal with. It blocks this other pathway that may have may help sort of the immune system um, uh, uh, attack and be able to target the cancer cells. And then it targets this other pathway, <clears throat> IL-2, that may actually directly prevent the lymphoma cells from growing. And so I think this is just one of the, the really kind of exciting preclinical uh, to now clinical work that, that we'll see um, in the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma space, and, and I look forward to the further development of this drug. There was, unlike in past years, there were no big uh, randomized studies that were really practice changing, uh, probably in, in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, but some small steps in the right direction. And one of the ways that that uh, one of the uh, uh, investigations by uh, Dr. Barta um, used two drugs that we now, that are each are currently FDA approved uh, to be used in cutaneous T cell lymphoma, but thought that they might be good partners together for this rationale here um, with this drug Ramadepsin, which is a histone deacetylase inhibitor. It falls in the camp of what we call epigenetic modifiers. There's some reason to think that that may increase the expression of this marker called CD30, and CD30 is the marker on the cells that brentuximab can target. And so, you know, his work uh, very early on, obviously, you see here only seven patients uh, being studied so far with this combination, but encouraging in that five of seven patients so far have responded to it. And this this concept of sort of taking uh, partnering drugs together um, in a synergistic way is kind of a, a theme that, that we're seeing across all lymphomas, but particularly, I think, in, in the T-cell lymphoma space. So we'll get back a little bit to cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and some of the, the uh, studies that are ongoing, but I want to jump to probably where, <clears throat> excuse me, where some of the, uh, uh, the probably the majority of the the most exciting studies that came out of ASH this year really in the aggressive uh, T-cell lymphomas, or what we call nodal T-cell lymphomas, sometimes called PTCLs, or peripheral T-cell lymphomas. Um, we These are aggressive diseases. We tend to treat them with one of these chemo cocktails here. Uh, some of that choice in which of those combinations is based on the subtype, <clears throat> Uh, but people get initially six cycles of uh, chemotherapy, and then we consider the role of autologous uh, bone marrow transplant at the end of uh, six cycles, assuming people are responding. 
So first, just to provide some updates, um, we know that that those regimens that I just discussed, the CHOP, CHOAP, Rentuximab, CHP, uh, with at least the first three regimens, CHOP, CHOAP, and EPOC, most patients, um, most people will probably relapse. And so we're constantly trying to find new ways uh, to improve upon that and find new therapies. So this first study here, uh, this was not presented for the first time, Echelon 2, this year, but was updated by Dr. Horwitz. So this is a randomized study that looks at brentuximab plus CHP versus CHOP, with CHOP being a historical standard in this disease. And he provided us an update that basically continues to show that brentuximab plus CHP in the population of patients that are CD30 positive, which again is what brentuximab targets, um, th- that this regimen brentuximab plus CHP is better than CHOP. Um, and it improved both progression-free survival as well as overall survival in this population. So has certainly become a standard for this population of patients that are CD30 positive. Uh, and that is you know, maybe about a third of patients uh, with, with T-cell lymphomas that have CD30 positivity. Uh, so we need still a, a most uh, peripheral T-cell lymphomas and most aggressive T-cell lymphomas are not CD30. And so we are continuing to try to find new ways and new efforts to improve upon that. The uh, uh, French group uh, presented a randomized study that compares ramadepsin, which is a again, a histone deacetylase inhibitor, currently FDA approved, with CHOP as compared to CHOP. Um, so it randomizes uh, one-to-one in, uh, with each of these uh, approaches. And unfortunately, there was no difference uh, between ramadepsin plus CHOP and CHOP uh, with regards to progression, uh, free survival. Or, or, so there, there was not an improvement with ramadepsin plus CHOP. Um, this was uh, maybe a bit surprising to some. Um, the one thing that, that came out of this, and I think certainly warrants further investigation, is that we see that the ramadepsin, or what we call Rho plus CHOP uh, arm, had, there were significant reductions and dose delays requiring many people to not get all their cycles of chemo. And people kind of hypothesized that that may be a contributing factor to why this, uh, this regimen, ramadepsin plus CHOP, was not better than CHOP. Um, and there, and we also are learning that certain subtypes, uh, specifically this this subtype of aggressive T cell lymphomas called angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphomas, may uh, seem to do better even as a single agent with ramadepsin. And while it didn't, uh, it, it, that population of patients tended to have a little bit better outcomes with ROCHOP as compared to CHOP, but was not uh, st- statistically significant. So again, uh, talking about newly diagnosed approaches and some of the efforts here, this was probably the most most uh, uh, encouraging or most exciting new approach in aggressive T cell lymphomas. This is a this drug oral azacitidine, which again is a drug not FDA approved in uh, aggressive T cell lymphomas, but is a drug uh, that has activity <clears throat> and uh, we know works as a single agent. So this is a phase two study that looked at oral azacitidine, which is a we we'll call it hypomethylator. Again, this is a similar, uh, it's an epigenetic drug, so it's kind of similar in the same camp as the ramadepsins, but very different mechanism, um, or slightly different mechanism, I should say. Uh, but this regimen in a, uh, a small study, 21 patients, was very encouraging, where it had 85% overall response rate. Um, so that's you know certainly better than what we'd expect to see with other regimens. This is obviously early on in its investigation, but definitely an exciting um, approach. And it's already led to a bigger, larger, randomized study that's um, in a cooperative group setting where we're comparing this regimen, azacitidine plus CHOP, or with, uh, or with CHOAP actually, as compared to duvelisib, which is another drug we can discuss, um, with CHOAP uh, versus CHOAP by itself. So this is a you know, phase three trial that um, we will, of course, wait and see the results of, but very, very uh, exciting trial um, uh, th- that will, that will um, commence and, and, and look forward to it in this disease. 
Another trial that we want to highlight, I mentioned before, brintuximab plus uh, CHP. So that was studied in the setting of CD30 expressing T-cell lymphomas or CD30 positive T-cell lymphomas. Uh, so this is a, a study um, where we're looking at if people with less than uh, or sort of low-level CD30 expression, who technically would not have been eligible for that prior randomized study, to see if they'll benefit from brentuximab plus CHP. So this will be another exciting ongoing trial that we look forward to in years to come. And I highlight, lastly, here some uh, nice preclinical work, again, that we're looking at trying to pull out subsets, trying to better understand uh, um, which which uh, aggressive T cell lymphomas may benefit from certain therapies, and there seems to be a population of aggressive T cell lymphomas that that harbor this mutation, and um, uh, they that that may be predictive uh, of response to certain drugs as well as, uh, and we may want to target or use different approaches in that in that cohort of patients. So, you know making small steps towards trying to figure out which patients uh, will benefit from which drugs and which approaches. And I can see sort of many years from now that we have sort of a number of good uh, frontline approaches to depending on what subtype of T-cell lymphoma uh, you have. Moving to the relapse setting, um, of course, we have the three FDA-approved drugs here, um, which with uh, less than ideal response rates, and we, of course, want to uh, look at some of the studies um, in the relapse setting to do better, to try to get more uh, exciting, novel, uh, targeted therapies with better outcomes in that space. Uh, Dr. Pro uh, updated us on the data for duvalisib, which is a PI3 kinase inhibitor that you heard briefly about with Dr. Smith, and uh, this, you see here, uh, this is combining kind of phase one and phase two uh, data for this drug duvelisib by itself in the relapse setting with aggressive, P -cell, aggressive peripheral T-cell lymphomas. And we saw an overall response rate of 40%, which again, if you think back to the slide I just showed, is higher than uh, those, those studies. So it, it's definitely an encouraging, um, encouraging uh, approach that I think it, it is working towards uh, probably approval at some point in the near future. Um, getting back to the combination approaches and uh, really immunotherapeutic approaches in aggressive T-cell lymphomas, ramidepsin, again, a drug we know is approved to see if it might partner well with this immunotherapeutic drug, pembrolizumab. And in a small, uh, a small number of patients, as most of these studies are, uh, we saw a 53% overall response rate, which was encouraging, and, and we will continue to uh, evaluate that. And I think um, the this strategy of combining uh, maybe immunotherapeutic drugs with other drugs is something is a theme that you'll see as probably the rest of my slides go through here. And <clears throat> highlighting this last bullet on this slide is that there, there may be patients. Um, uh, that don't benefit from, say, ramidepsin plus pembrolizumab, and we're trying to sort of, as always, trying to understand which aggressive T-cell lymphomas benefit from which drugs, and in this study, they showed that maybe certain markers may be suggestive of response. So there's a number of uh, immunotherapeutic trials in the relapse setting. This is a, another drug kind of like pembrolizumab, <clears throat> targeting a very similar, similar molecule. Um, and I highlight this not because it was a good um, a good uh, outcome in terms of the study, but highlighted that as a single drug, this av avelumab is not a good drug for T-cell lymphomas, but that maybe with the right combination, potentially like with that ramidepsin that I just mentioned, is a good combination. And so I, uh, these are all uh, things we're evaluating here. Similarly, nivolumab, uh, which is an immunotherapeutic drug uh, in combination with standard uh, chemo, gemcitabine, and oxaloplatin. Uh, not overly exciting, again, but I think it's... And so these two strategies may not be strategies we see in the future, but it doesn't mean that these drugs are not drugs that can be utilized. We need to really build build things uh, from kind of the, the bench to the bedside and truly understand and try to, try to figure out why... Uh, 
drugs like nivolumab or what the right partner might be. And you'll see um, in this next slide that they tried to figure out which patients might benefit from, from this from uh, this approach of, uh, of uh, the checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapeutic approach with GEMOX. And they tried to really, you know, figure out if there was a certain subset that maybe benefited more. Um, they, uh, to this point, couldn't really clearly sh show uh, which patients benefited, but I think these are, these are important things that we need to look forward to try to understanding as we move forward. So a uh, study that is open to all EBV or Epstein-Barr Epstein virus positive lymphomas, but so it's open across B and T cell lymphomas. But interestingly, uh, we've enrolled 10 patients uh, with T and NK cell lymphomas uh, to this approach. And so it's only, this is only specific for really EBV positive T cell lymphomas or EBV positive NK cell lymphomas. And, um, and we've seen very encouraging approaches. This is using a drug that's a histone deacetylase inhibitor called nanotinostat in combination with valgancyclovir, which helps target the virus. Um, I, I highlight this uh, in part because it shows really how we are uh, taking this heterogeneous disease of T-cell lymphomas and trying to pull out the subsets that really might benefit from specific therapies. And this is a great example of saying, this is the, these are the EBV-positive T-cell lymphomas. We think that they're going to benefit from this approach and then using that approach for, for, these, for this population. And so I think it's a great model of, of how we are sort of approaching um, uh, uh, this, this heterogeneous disease across the board. Additionally, in NK cell lymphomas, there was a nice another immunotherapeutic trial using a checkpoint inhibitor in combination with a different histone deacetylase inhibitor that was really encouraging. <clears throat> it's from a Chinese group that, um, and they kind of highlight here why these this uh, epigenetic drug epigenetic drug chitamide might combine well with a checkpoint inhibitor. So then, just kind of finishing up and going back to. Uh, uh, both CTCL and PTCL. So in the relapse setting, we uh, often will study uh, all T-cell lymphomas. Like I mentioned the, from the get-go, some cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is aggressive and needs um, and, and cannot respond to many of the FDA-approved therapies and need things like clinical trials and and need uh, and certainly need better therapies in that in, in that aggressive cohort of patients. So these are trials that were open in both peripheral T-cell lymphomas as well as cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. Um, this is a different, really kind of interesting, exciting immunotherapeutic approach where uh, this targets kind of the innate portion of the immune system uh, by, by <laughs> excuse me, by blocking a, a uh, marker called CD47 that I think is probably better highlighted on this next slide. Uh, CD47 is on can be on tumor cells, uh, and it tells sort of the immune system to, to <clears throat> sort of uh, say, don't eat me or leave me alone, and that way it can grow. And so by targeting and blocking that CD47, then the tumor cell can then potentially be recognized by the immune system. And the second portion of this, uh, this antibody you he see here in this Y shape, the green section, tries to help bring the uh, portion of the immune system, uh, the innate portion of the immune system, and specifically macrophages, to the tumor cell to help um, uh, get rid of it. So really kind of novel uh, approach and something that's being explored across lots of malignancies. Uh, I, you know, these responses that you see in the slide aren't overly exciting, but, but it is, uh, this is across a wide range of doses, and it's certainly possible that drugs like this, similar to the story that you've seen with uh, these other immune modulatory drugs and other checkpoint inhibitors, this drug, TTI-621, may be a good drug that combine with some of these, uh, some of these other, uh, some of the other types of therapies. And so lastly, I will just highlight um, the uh, work done from a very large 500-patient uh, retrospective series, kind of highlighting that the that there is still a role for allogeneic transplant in across all T cell lymphomas, um, and there are a few subsets that probably 
uh, do better, worse with allogeneic transplant, but that allogeneic transplant uh, is is still something that we certainly consider uh, for patients. And depending on the subtype, maybe may have a little bit more enthusiasm or less enthusiasm, where you see like the hepatosplenic T-cell lymphomas tend to do quite uh, much better. And these are two-year uh, disease-free survival estimates, um, which are uh, in- encouraging for for the, these these subtypes, uh, whereas NK cell lymphomas might not fare as well with an allogeneic transplant. And so, uh, I kind of wrap up and just go over some of the over uh, some of the topics or some of the drugs that we discussed a little bit. You know, there are a lot of really encouraging treatment options out there. Different kind of pathway inhibitors. You heard a little bit about PI3 kinase inhibitors. And we think about epigenetic modifiers in combination, these HDAC inhibitors or histone deacetylase inhibitors, different immunotherapeutic approaches, and then kind of one of our oldest really cellular therapy approaches, um, allogeneic transplant, still certainly playing a role. And with modern uh, supportive care and, and technologies, I think we do much better than, than historical uh, numbers in this retrospective series that I showed really kind of highlights that point. Uh, so with that, I will stop and take questions, and, or Dr. Smith and I will both take questions. And Great. Um, well, thank you both so much. Um, those were really in-depth, uh, wonderful overviews, and I know there's always a, a lot to cover, so we really appreciate that breakdown. Um, and we'll now begin our Q&A portion. Uh, just a reminder, please keep your questions as general as possible. Uh, we probably can't get to every question. Um, there's quite a number of people on this call, and if you have a question related to COVID specifically, please tune into our COVID ASH webinar, which will take place in a couple of weeks. You can find that information on lymphoma.org. And our first question um, for the day is for Dr. Smith. Uh, can rituximab and lenalidomide combination be used for other types of lymphoma, such as malt lymphomas? Yeah, that's a really great question. So lenalidomide and rituximab is currently FDA approved for slow-growing lymphomas, particularly follicular, um, in the relapse setting, meaning that it's come back. Um, in the frontline setting, there is um, it's listed in NCCN guidelines that we can use it. Um, in terms of other lymphomas, it's very active in marginal zone lymphoma, also called MALT, um, and uh, many physicians can use it in that setting. Uh, when it comes to mantle cell, which I think there was uh, one question about that, it's not currently FDA approved, but it is lenalidomide is active in this disease, and there is a frontline trial um, that looks very exciting, but it's still not FDA approved. Great, thank you. Um, our next question will be for Dr. Haruka. How does um, azacitidine differ from romadepsin? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so they are both drugs that, that fit into the category of what we call epigenetic modifiers, but ramadepsin is, uh, affects things uh, called histones, so it's a histone deacetylase inhibitor, whereas azacitidine affects methylation, um, so it's a hypomethylator. Both of these drugs affect the way that genes, uh, genes are expressed, turned on and off in our body, so they both have similar... Uh, sort of uh, big, largely have similar mechanisms, but affect very different portions of sort of ways that the genes are turned on and off. Thank you. Um, Our next question, uh, Dr. Smith, how long was the duration of response in bispecific antibodies, V CAR T cell? Yeah, so the the challenge is that with the bispecific antibodies, very few of them have uh, have been have been going on for more than let's say six to twelve months. So they're really really new. All we know is that they're active and that in some people they can last quote unquote a long time. But the total amount of time that people have been followed is generally less than a year. So right now CAR T is still you know it's FDA approved for this space. Uh, but I do think that the bispecifics offer a less intensive and uh, hopefully cheaper option, um, you know, more effective, more value, if you will, down the road. We just don't know that yet because it's not been around for too long. Okay, thanks so much. Um, the next question is for uh, Dr. Haberkus. For allogeneic transplant, is there a type of patient that is best for this option in relapsed refractory T-cell lymphomas? 
Also a good question. Um, it's a complicated answer, but I will try to. There is, a, of course, um, so allogeneic transplant, to even get to the point where that's an option, really have to have really good control of the disease <clears throat> to begin with. Uh, so you need to be, have some sort of response to some prior therapy before thinking about consolidating with an allogeneic transplant. The other difficult thing with an allogeneic transplant is that most states, uh, or at least Medicare, does not cover allotransplant for lymphomas in most states. So over 65, while not a, a real cutoff or reason to not get an allogeneic transplant, uh, it is not offered. Uh, Medicare will not cover it. So for most places, we won't even think about offering an allogeneic transplant for people over 65. It does vary a little bit based on state, but for most states, that seems to be the case. So it's um, sort of a little bit of a uh, logistical challenge and um, but there are some real, uh, the medical issues, you know, there are a lot that goes into a transplant, um, including things things like a need for a caregiver and need to be close to a transplant center for a period of time. So there are lots of um, supportive care issues or, and uh, issues around that too. But the the biggest one is need to be have disease and good response to even really be considered and, and likely have be under 65. Thank you. Um... Dr. Smith, did the R2 study you mentioned include mantle cell lymphoma patients with both TP53 deletion and mutation? No, the the R2 uh, study that I presented actually was not uh, did not include mantle cell lymphoma at all. It had marginal zone lymphoma and follicular lymphoma, not mantle cell. So for mantle cell lymphoma, uh, there's very limited data. But as I was saying, it's for people who have never been treated before. This came out of Cornell. Um, I was actually one of the authors as well, and it seems very active, uh, but very few people had P53 mutations. So I think we still need a, a bit of data on that. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is for treatment naive. Is it better to start with a monotherapy with indefinite duration or a combo therapy with definitive time therapy? And, and kind of either of you or both can take this question. Uh, I can go ahead and answer that. It uh, has to do mostly with B-cell lymphomas, and usually we talk about that in the context of CLL, which is in, not a topic we covered today, but it is a slow-growing B-cell cancer where there's options for uh, something like a BTK inhibitor that you take forever, a pill, versus chemotherapy, which is shorter. And, you know, so far, with very few exceptions, there's no difference in how long people live uh, or the, you know, um, between those two approaches. So I always think it's a discussion with patients. That being said, I think chemotherapy has less and less of a role. And, um, you know, the, the goal right now is to find uh, targeted treatment and try to test if we can give it for a shorter period of time. And there's actually an intergroup study being run right now um, that may answer that question. Yeah, I, Great, thank you I, so much. Yes, yeah, go ahead. I guess as it, as it pertains to, to T cell lymphomas, you know, really, currently we only have in the relapse setting FDA approved single FDA approval for the various single agents that are approved. Um, but I think, you know, as I mentioned, that the field is really moving towards a combination approach for better responses, synergistic. Uh, there are certain drugs that might work well together. I mentioned, and so I think combinations is probably the future for T-cell lymphomas um, in, down the road. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, the next question for Dr. Harvick is, which medications have side effects of peripheral neuropathy, if you're able to clarify that? Uh, so there's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of drugs that can cause peripheral neuropathy. Uh, most, the, with regards to, to T-cell lymphoma, I think the most relevant ones um, are the ones that are included in, in upfront therapy for newly diagnosed aggressive T-cell lymphomas. So that would be uh, vincristine as part of the CHOP, uh, which is the, the Oncovin or O, uh, and then brentuximab, um, which also can cause neuropathy, which is part of the brentuximab plus CHP uh, combination regimen. Uh, there doesn't seem to be huge differences uh, in rates of neuropathy, uh, whether you're getting brentuximab or the vincristine part of, uh, as part of CHOP, but um, both can cause neuropathy and something that we very closely watch 
um, when people are getting therapy and make uh, and make dose adjustments when neuropathy occurs in most scenarios. Great. We have um, time for just a couple more questions. Uh, Dr. Smith, um, I know you discussed copolisib and rituximab for follicular lymphoma. Is that during watch and wait? Um, should someone seek treatment instead of watch and wait? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, the study was actually for people who had sim symptoms. And the reason we wait for symptoms or some indication for treatment in the indolent lymphomas is that we have a number of trials done in the past um, that have compared, you know, observation, active observation versus immediate treatment. And the problem is that uh, exposing somebody to therapy, if they look well, feel well, and, you know, have no symptoms, does not help them live longer or live better. And so because of that, we tend to wait to treat until there's a sign. One day, if there is a treatment that works that can cure the disease, um, you know, maybe then we would treat people who have no symptoms. But until then, um, we do wait. And the copen lisib study was no different. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Hubbard, this is our last question of today. Uh, what does research say about DNMT3A mutations? Uh, so it's still early days for trying to, to guide therapies in T-cell lymphomas based on different mutations or different uh, sort of profiles that they might have. But it seems that this patients that have a DNMT3A mutation may um, have different outcomes than, than patients that do not, and they also may be sensitive to certain drugs, uh, particularly like the hypomethylators and the azacitidine. Now, this is still you know, not, not something that's FDA approved and not something that necessarily we can use clinically yet, but I think is certainly where the field is going. Um, just like I, I had mentioned that certain subtypes of aggressive T-cell lymphomas um, can benefit maybe more so than other drugs, uh, more than other subsets. Um, I think DNMT3A patients may benefit from um, drugs like azacitidine, and I think that's that's uh, certainly where where the field is going. And and, and um, so I guess stay tuned. Great. Um, well, I'd like to thank you both so much uh, for taking the time out of today to join us, um, and I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us on today's call. Uh, we had uh, you know, over 500 people here today, and I know everyone had a lot of questions and um, on this really important topic. So we hope everyone found the information both informative and also hopeful. We'd also like to thank our sponsors again for making this program possible. Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, Kite Agilead Company, and Regeneron. Please remember if you have any additional questions or you'd like to be connected with someone else who has been impacted by lymphoma, you can reach out to the LRF helpline at 800-500-9976. Also, at the conclusion of this program, you'll receive an email prompting you to complete a program evaluation. I'd ask you please take a few moments to complete this, as they're very important for us to ensure that we deliver the most useful and meaningful programming. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful day.